Hi, everyone. Um, so next up, we have Matthew Gretton dan and he's the tech lead of Lenara's Toolchain Working Group. And he'll be talking about porting and optimizing code for 64-bit ARM. So put your hands together for Ma Matthew Gretton dan Thank you very much. So yes, I'm Matt Gretton dan I lead the Toolchain Working Group in Lenaro. Um, so I'm going to talk about porting and optimizing code from 32-bit ARM to 64-bit ARM. And just as a question, how many people know have heard of ARM? Raise of hands. Oh, some, some. Two of them, yes, are meant to be know about ARM. So I'll just ARM um, design CPUs, and then license that IP to manufacturers, and they manufacture the CPUs. Um, I forget the exact number, but there are billions of ARM chips um, shipped every year, and they go into things like your mobile phone. And also, but also into more embedded devices, into things like hard drives or your camera, and even then into very small Internet of Things devices. Um, what I'm interested in here is talking about their larger mobile phone type or server type CPUs, where they've recently re announced ARM v8, which has a 64 bit. Historically, they've just been 32 bit, but now they've got a 64 bit architecture. Um, so I represent the Naro which is lots of companies from the ARM ecosystem coming together, trying to make Linux on ARM work well. Um, this presentation has four parts. I'm going to talk about um, register files, um, structure layout, and data models. And I'm going to talk a bit about atomics, and then vectorization, and something called neon intrinsics. Um, There'll be a Q I hope to talk for about 45 minutes. There'll be a Q&A session at the end, so it'd be good because I can't actually see you all with the lights very well if we leave the Q&A, if you have any questions, to the end, please. Um, first, some warnings or some notes. This is a gross simplification. Not, I'm not going to say anything that's wrong, but I'm talking about people writing code for apps. I'm not talking about anything complicated in the kernel. I'm talking about little engine only. I'm not talking about big engine. Um, and actually, there's probably a lot of other stuff I'm going to talk about that I've assumed by default that actually I'm not going to pick up. So if you do have things, do ask at the end. Um, I also have a bit of a bias. My job is writing compilers or getting compilers written, um, which does involve an assembler, but I don't like assembly. So the message from this talk is trust your compiler. Your compiler probably does actually know better than you. And if it doesn't, that's a bug. Um, go and talk to your compiler writers to find out why it doesn't know better than you. Um, some people might disagree with that view. They're entitled to, but that's my v point of view. So why 64-bit? Actually, there's one reason for 64 bits memory. No other reason. We want to access more than 4 gigabytes of memory that is what 32 gigs gives you, or 32 bits gives you, which is 4 gigs. 64-bit allows much more memory to be accessed than that. Um, although actually, usually not two to the 64 um, bits of, uh, bytes of memory, as the architecture designs normally limit this to actually 40 or 48 bits of addressing. So this is not about performance. But moving up to 64 bits from 32 bits has consequences. So I'm going to look at two of those consequences now. We're going to talk about register files and then structure layout. Um, and they come from different ends. The register file is a very low-level consequence. The structure layout is a bit more of a high-level consequence. So general purpose registers, 32-bit ARM, you've got 16 registers. They're 32 bits long to hold a 32-bit pointer. And R13, R14, R15 have special purposes in the architecture. Um, R13 is SP, it's the stat pointer. So that's where local variables, the address for local variables get stored into based off of um, R14 is the link register. That's where, when you do a call to a function, the address to return to gets stored. R15 is the program counter, which in 32-bit ARM is sort of the current address of the, that you're executing. There's an offset in there for historic reasons, but that's basically what goes on. So that's the 32-bit world. What do we need to do for a 64-bit world? Well, let's expand these registers to 64-bit. We need to do that because, hey, we've got 64-bit addresses. That's what we want to store an address in. Um, and anyway, re experience tells us that 16 registers isn't enough. Let's have some more. 
just because we're changing the architecture, we might as well change things. Um, so let's go for 31 registers. Now, note that 31 is not a power of two. There is a good reason for that. Um, one of them is because actually, the stat point from program counter are special registers that you always need. So let's actually make them into special registers and move the link register across. Um, so one of the reasons we only have 31 general purpose registers is so that the 32nd one can represent the stat pointer or program counter or even zero, depending on context. And the other thing is, let's actually give two different views of these registers. Let's have a WN view of register RN, which is 32 bits, because actually we're still mostly going to want to program in 32 bits for some stuff. And let's then have XN for the full 64 bit. And if you write to the 32 bit one, the top bits of the 64 bit register get cleared. So, what are the consequences of this? Um, it's easier to do 64 bit arithmetic, um, which may sound stupid as a consequence and very obvious, but actually, if your algorithms are heavily 64 bit integer arithmetic based, that's probably, I think, about a three times speed up, two to three times speed up just there. The fact that on ARM in a 32 bit world, where if you want to do 64 bit stuff, you have to do it two adds to do a 64-bit add, because you've got to do the, each half of the 64-bit thing separately. There's things to do there. So it's easier to do 64-bit arithmetic. Obvious, but actually quite important in some algorithms. There's less need to spill to the stack. So when you've got 16 registers, all you've got is 16 places to store data that you've got going or numbers that you're doing your calculations and basic calculations off of. When you've got 31, you've got much more space. And actually, that can affect how you design your algorithm. So when you've got 16 registers, you're going to want to recalculate things quite a bit. But when you've got 31, you can just store, keep them stored and floating around because that, that's easier. And that can change how you do spills. Um, and as I say, spare registers to keep more temporaries. So let's now move on from that. That's, so as I said, this is quite top, top level view. We're not going to get into too much detail and stuff. I'm happy to answer questions later, but this is going to be top level stuff. So let's talk about structure layout. So here's how we would lay out this structure. I've got a structure that's a 32-bit integer A, a pointer to something P, and a 32-bit integer X. In 32-bit world, that's how it gets laid out. Um, it's nice 12 bytes of data each nicely. Now, if we were to take this and just port this straight to a 64-bit um, code, this is what the structure layout will look like. Um, obviously, P grows by 4 bytes. It becomes an 8-byte value. It's a pointer. That's to be expected. But there's this hole between bytes 4 and 8. Um, why a hole? What's the point of a hole? Well, there's this thing called the ABI that says how you should lay structures out. And it says pointers should be aligned to an 8-byte boundary. And because of the way the C rules work, or C++ rules, you've got to lay things out in order. So you get A at 0, because that's an int 32. 32-byte 32 value should be aligned to 4-byte boundary. So 0 is that. Um, let me come along P. We've got to put P in somewhere. Well, 4 doesn't. 4 isn't an 8-byte boundary, so we're going to move to the next 8-byte boundary. So P goes into 8, and then X goes at the end. Um, so is there anything wrong with having a hole? Well, it wastes memory. But we've got lots of memory. We've got all these terabytes of memory. Yeah, but you've got that's out at main memory. That's your RAM on your CPU or off on your SOC or that you've plugged in, and you might even have swaps. So that's hard disk. That's slow to access memory. The memory we're interested in in algorithms quite often is the caches on the CPU, which are faster to access. And there, you've got tens to hundreds of kilobytes. So actually, this hole, which takes up 20% of the um, structure, could be quite important, depending on your algorithm, because it's filling up your cache with memory you're never going to access. Um, so what can we do about that? Well, the obvious thing is to rearrange um, your structure layouts. Um, 
generally I write, I try to design structures so the things I know that's going to be big go up the top and then do things, smaller things further down and then you get the structure size back to a sensible 16 which we can't do, bytes which we can't do anything about. So I want to draw your attention to something else here for porting purposes. Note that I've used int 32t um, for the types of a and x. Um, why have I done that? What's wrong with just using int? Um, well, that's because actually the size of int isn't defined anywhere by the C++ standard. Um, instead, this ABI, this application binary interface that I talked about earlier, defines that um, for you. And so let's just have a brief aside. Um, so there's this thing, so most people know what an API is, an application programming interface. That defines the interfaces you can use as a programmer to call into libraries or to do things. And it's, so it's fairly high level. It's C interface, it's the C++ interface, Java, Python, whatever. An ABI is an application binary interface. And that tells you how to write as effectively how your C code, when you call a function, what you have to do to call that function. So I've called a function with three parameters. Where do I put the parameters in registers? Where does the result go? I've got a structure. How do I lay it out? How do I do virtual functions in C++? Um, so the ABI isn't in the architecture per se. It's not enforced by the CPU. But it is a document that compiler writers and OS vendors and the architecture designers have come up with that says, this is how we're going to work to make things op interoperate and to get, hopefully, good performance out of the machine. And so going back to this structure layout, why int 32t and int 32x? Well, int is 32 bits, isn't it, everywhere? Well, there's actually different data models. So, the 32-bit world uses this thing called ILP32, where int, long, and pointer are all 32 bits, and the long, long is 64 bits. The Unix world, including Linux, uses something called LP64, where int remains 32 bits, but long, 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 and pointer all become 64 bits. Um, other operating systems at 64 bit use a different mechanism called LLP64 where long remains as 32 bits, but long, long, and pointer as 64 bits. So these are different APIs, and you should care about the fact that these are different APIs, because if you're writing code that transfers data between computers via structures that you've written in C, and that code is run on a 32-bit machine or different 64-bit machines with different data models, the actual code, you're introducing bugs if you're using into long and assuming that's just going to work because um, the data models are the same. If the data models are different, using into long isn't going to work, as shown here. If you, so here we've got int long and int again without. So that's using the native C++ types or C types. And again, that introduces a whole. So if I'm reading L, I'm going to get different values depending on which data model I use. Um, this, is a, this introduces hard to find bugs. This is actually, for me, one of the important things about finding, about porting, is you've got to just sit down and look at your code and check that actually, if I'm communicating outside my program, my communication interfaces are well defined, the sizes and the layouts. And that's a simple matter of porting. It doesn't matter about performance. That's you're going to have bugs if that doesn't work. So that's it. Really, for um, porting from 32-bit to 64-bit, we are interested in the fact that memory's got bigger. Um, and that's all the architecture needs to do. It just needs to give you 64-bit registers um, and possibly some 64-bit operations to work on those registers. That'd be quite nice, except there's always one more thing. CPU architects can't leave a good thing alone. Um, and so they're bound, they've, they've got this new architecture, it's 64-bit, it's a great idea. Let's go and change absolutely everything. Let's remove conditionalization. Um, so the ARM architecture has this, or the original ARM architecture had this fantastic feature where every instruction could be conditionally executed. You could say either always execute it or execute it if the last comparison set the zero flag or set the negative flag or the carry flag or combinations of those. Um, they went a bit far in that they added um, never execute this instruction. 
So a whole 16th of the instruction space was never executed because that was its condition code. Um, and so that was a bit of a waste of space. But also conditionalization is hard to do in modern CPUs, which are out of order and trying to guess what code path you're going down. And if all your code is conditionally executed, you're having to make guesses at each instruction, which am I going to execute this or am I not? Am I going to execute the next instruction based on the previous one or am I not? And it's sort of bifurcation of possible routes. So CPU designers don't actually like it. So let's get rid of it. We don't actually get rid of all of it. There's some left. The useful bits are left. Conditional comparisons, um, conditional adds and subtracts, and conditional moves. Let's add some new load storage semantics as well. Um, so as time has gone on, we've seen that how you do those stores have changed. I'm going to talk about atomics in a moment. But basically, the requirements on atomics have changed. Let's add some more instructions that support those atomics. Let's change the register layout. So these are, I'm just taking these as high level things we're doing that were, that were done in the architecture. So the register file I talked about a minute or two ago is only dealing with integer registers. It does integer add, integer subtract. It doesn't do any floating point or this thing called SIMD. Um, there's a separate register file for that. And on ARM, historically, it's looked like this, that you've got your single registers. So your single floating point registers go along S0 to S3, and your double floating point registers overlap those. So that if you write to D0, for instance, you actually destroy the contents of S0 and S1. Um, and if you write to Q0, which is a vector register and is 128 bits, you destroy D1, D0, and therefore S3, S2, S1, and S0. Um, these are views on the same register file. It's different views on the same register file. For 64-bit, this was considered difficult to understand. And so they simplified it a bit. And so you've got Q's gone. You've just got a vector register. And the lower half of that vector register is also D0. And the lower half of D0 is also S1. So that simplifies how things work. But actually, it does change your algorithms. If you made use of this rather strange layout in your algorithm, um, this is going to break it. And yes, they added some more SIMD instructions because they thought that was a good idea. Some of them are to help tidy up vector loops at the end. So if you do SIMD is single instruction, multiple data. So you're trying to do multiple iterations of a loop at once. And if your loop iteration count doesn't neatly come into your vector length, then there's some nice instructions available now to help with that. And there's lots more stuff. Um, I can't remember it all because it really did rewrite lots of bits of the architecture. Um, some of it is how the whole exception model works, so that's of interest to kernel writers, um, which I'm not covering today. But basically, here's some, they, that's some things they talked about. So I'm now going to talk about atomics. Um, so one of my points from this talk is, as I said before, please don't go away writing assembler, because you end up with people doing this. So this is meant to be an atomic ad right? for all architectures. So you're, not, you're meant to see no, it's meant to be atomic. You're meant to not be able to break this ad. So let's do it. Well, for x86, I have no idea if this code works, because I don't know x86 assembler. Um, this is based upon some real code I have seen in the wild, but I've changed things to protect the guilty. Um, and so let's do something special for x86. But for everyone else in the entire universe, let's just do a standard pointer, add, and return. Um, that's not atomic. There's at least three places in there where I can change the value of pointer and get a different result to actually what was expected. Huh, so what should we do about this? Well, let's go and read the compiler manual. This is always a good idea, actually reading manuals. And there's this function, new in 4.8, GCC 4.8. So I'm, I, I work mostly with GCC, so compiler I've used for all of this is GCC. Um, and it's called Atomic Add Fetch. And the manual says these built in, well, you can read that. Basically, it does what we've just said here. It does on the right, but it does it in a function. It says it will be atomic. Hmm. So that sounds like a good idea. Oh, 
And actually, if we do that, it should work on x86, on ARM, on 64-bit ARM, which is ARC64, um, on MIPS, on Power, on SH, on everyone. So let's do that. That's what it is. But there's a little problem here. There's this parameter mem model. What does mem model mean? Um, so the next bits of slides took me five hours to write as I tried to yet again get my head around atomic memory models. Um, so this is probably the difficult bit for me to understand this topic, so bear with me, please, as I try to get this right. So C++11 defines three types of memory model which GCC base, um, GCC's atomic support is based upon these three types. It goes a bit further. There's something called sequentially consistent. There's something called acquire release. Um, but it actually, acquire release has an alternative model called consume release, which I'm not going to cover, and something called relaxed. So what are these things? So sequentially, uh, sequentially consistent. If nothing else, I can't pronounce the words. This basically says if we do A, then we, if we store A to 1, and then we store X, the value X20, then on, in another thread, we can see, let me start this again. So each box is a thread, separate thread of execution, you possibly on a different CPU, possibly not, but they're different threads of execution. F uh, variables starting with low letters of the alphabet, so A, B, C, are shared memory variables. They're not, the storing to them is not protected by anything, but you store them and you can read them in multiple threads. X, Y, Z vari named variables here, so the ones that you store and you load from, they are atomic variables. So Storing to them has consequences on the memory. There is an atomic uh, model, and there's a consequence to storing to that that we talk about depending on the memory model. So the default, and this is C++ code, so the default is something called sequentially consistent, which means that when you store to 20, store 20 into X, the whole system will have seen the stores before it. In this case, A is 1. So in another thread, you can be guaranteed, if you're using a sequentially consistent model, that if you load X and it has 20 in it, then A must have 1 in it. That is your sequentially consistent model. Um, and that's basically, that's mostly what you actually expect code to work like, that things happen in order. And if, if you wrote A equals 1, and you wrote X store 20, you expect a to have been made one before you wrote um, x store t uh, put 20 into x. Of course, you could go all hippie and be relaxed and not actually care tuppence about this. And if your memory order relaxed, stores happen in any order you like. So storing 20 into x doesn't mean we stored 1 into a. Or it might. It doesn't guarantee. There's no guarantee. So this x here is it could fail. It's not it's going to fail because we don't know what's happening in the system. It could f this assert could fail. We can't be guaranteed by loading x and seeing that it's got 20 in it that a will have 1 in it, which is very nice and relaxed and is sort of the other extreme from the sequentially consistent. Um, so there's this thing called acquire release, which sits in the middle. And that basically says that if you've got two different threads, you don't have a, we're not defining the order things happen in each of the threads. So other threads may see both that the store to y of 20 has happened, but the store to the x of, zero of 10 hasn't, or the store to x of 10 has happened, but the store to y of 20 has ha hasn't happened. Either way is valid at the same time in your program execution. Um, what you do get is that if you've stored a to be 1 before the x store, then you can be guaranteed that if you look at x and it's got 10 in it, then A will have the value you stored into it. Sequentially cons this is, so this is different from sequentially consistent in that sequentially consistent says that you will see one of the two behaviors in your program. It doesn't necessarily guarantee which behavior you will see because of the order of things happen, but you will either see that x has been s stored and y hasn't, or and not y has been stored, but x hasn't, or the other way around. You will not see um, the state with acquire, where at the same time, both states can be valid. Your program has sequentially consistent means your program has been 
ordered somehow, and between threads, that's a bit more difficult to understand. Um, so as I said earlier, but on a qua release, if you store into A, and then you store atomically with a release of X, then checking that X has got 20 in it will guarantee that A has got one in it. So that's sort of a halfway house between the relax, where I d actually orders and stores and those can happen anywhere, and um, sequentially consistent, where everything happens in a very definite order. Here, things happen in, basically, you can view this as things happen in a thread in order, but the order that thread and other threads are interleaved, that order isn't defined. So basically, this means that we should put into the atomic op the memory model, atomic, um, the, co the predefined for sequentially consistent. Um, why that one? Well, because by default, that's how people expect programs to work. Right? It's the one that's going to introduce these bugs. However, if you're writing your code and you're looking at your program, you should be examining your whole program and going, is this actually right? Because for a program to be sequentially consistent, every time I do an atomic write, I've got to flush everything out into the memory system and out into my memory and check all the cores on the system are all synced up. And that's a lot of time. Whereas if I say, OK, I'm going to do the acquire relaxed model, uh, uh, the acquire release model, I only need to worry about making sure this bit of this thread, so this CPU, has pushed its stuff out consistently and so that it will propagate in order to the rest of the system. There's less work to do with that than there is with the whole, I've got to push everything out to the whole system. And relaxed, of course, just says, well, it's going out there. In fact, the only thing relaxed guarantees you is that time won't flow backwards. So relaxed guarantees if I store 1 to A and then 2 to A, and I see the value 2 from, and I read A and I see the value 2, I'm not going to at some later time see 1 from A. Time's not going to flow backwards in your load store environment. So that's very brief view of Atomics. Go and read the manuals, because it explains it much better than I can. Um, but it is a case of get your head around it. It's, but here's one line. We don't need all of this large amounts of specialized code. The compiler should get this right. And it'll get, if you use the acquire release and your CPU doesn't support acquire release semantics, it will go and do the right thing to get sequentially consistent semantics. So your compiler will pick the things your CPU is capable of, so we don't need to port anymore. The compiler is doing all the porting for us. So that's my message of the day for this is go and use the newer compilers, read what features they have, and read what features C++ and C have in their new standards, and use them, because they make your life easier. And now for something completely different. So this is some code, some assembler code. So this isn't a real example because um, of programs in the world being ported because I had to um, get something that I could fit, fit on the slide, um, although it did make me find a few interesting features of the compiler. Um, so, But this is something that you will see code like this out there in the world. So what's this code do? It's got lots of Vs in it. The majority of the instructions start with V, which in 32-bit ARM stands for vector. So it's doing vector loads. And there's this VAD I32. So it's doing a vector add, which basically means that we've got these two vector registers. We're loading, and, we're let put, and they've been split into lanes. And we're adding each lane to each other and putting it in the result register. So this, to me, because I wrote it, so I know what it's doing. Looks like it's um, doing a vector add. It's, you've got two arrays, and you're adding each element of the arrays together and storing it in another array. In fact, if I was writing in C, it looks something like this. So we're add. We, we're, we're taking three, point, uh, three arrays in, which we assume have length n. And we're taking elements, each element in turn from B and C, adding them together and putting them in the appropriate element of A. 
So I wonder what a compiler does at 03. Well, that's a lot of code. And I'm amazed that I can read any of it here. Um, you're not meant to be able to read it. That's a lot of code. Um, what's actually going on here? Well, the compiler has to put out a header and a footer to talk to the assembler, tell it what's going on. Then the bit in orange is a vector loop. You can't see because this is 64-bit ARM, so they've got rid of all the Vs that on the instructions, but it's using its load 1, V0, 4S. So it's basically doing the vector loop that we wrote before. So that's good. Um, but there's this bit before. What that we just want this vector loop. We don't want anything else. So what have we got? So there's a question. Do the arrays overlap? So in C and C++, there is no guarantee that A, B, and C, even though B and C are defined as constants, don't overlap. Uh, so that by writing into A, you're not going to change. There's no guarantee you're not going to change what's in the array B. And this is a um, thing that catches lots of people out. So you could write into A, change the value of B, and so change what your, next, your future iterations of the loop. So we have to check that the arrays don't overlap. And if they do overlap, we've got to go each iteration one at a time. You've got to actually go back and do one iteration at a time around the loop so that we don't break things. And then this gray stuff is vector tidy up. So I mentioned earlier, if you've got a vector, the vector loop is doing four elements of your arrays at a time. And your tidy up is if n is um, 15, well, there's three extra. 15 mod 4 is 3, so you've got to do three extra loops at the end, or three extra one by one iterations at the end um, to finish off and tidy up your vector. So, how can we improve things? Well, C and C add this restrict um, keyword, which basically means to say these arrays don't overlap. Believe me, please. So that should get rid of the, do the overrays overlap and the overlap one by one loop. That'd be nice. Let's see what happens. Well, that's still a lot of code. Why have we got more code? What's going on here? Well, we've got rid of the array overlap, and we've replaced it by something else called peeling for alignment. Um, so peeling for alignment is basically the compiler decides that it thinks that you should be loading from aligned values, because that would be really um, speed the code up. If you're loading from aligned values and storing to an aligned value, you speed the code up because the, C the memory system will be used optimally. So it's not just instructions that matter here. It's how the memory system is used. And as we're not doing all this checking that things aren't overlapping, uh, we've got some more space. We can waste some more space on this. So it's added this. Um, but actually, can we get rid of this? Well, actually, yes, we can. We can sort of say, well, let's assume I'd like to be able to say that we enforce the alignment on the um, inputs, but that doesn't actually work in GCC for some reason. Oh, I couldn't get it to work. Anyway, if you do this, it works, and you get less code. So we've got rid of the function um, peeling for alignment by saying that we're going to say that these, these, loop, these arrays are aligned properly. And I've got a misprint there. That should be a C. Um, on the third line. Um, by assuming that they're aligned properly, you don't need to do this peeling for alignment. You could just go to the vector loop. So now what have we got? Well, there's much less code because the point size has increased. Um, I think we've gone from five point to eight point. Um, but we've got a header. We've got some functions set up. And this vector tidy up still. Can we do anything about that? Um, well, I'd like to be able to write something like this. I'd like to assert that we know that n mod 4 is 0. So you don't need to do any of this vector tidy up loop, because that would be really nice and well done. So we could get rid of that, and we could just keep the vector loop. But actually, I couldn't get GCC to do that for me. So I resorted to some, so now, ah, well, I want to get rid of this code. Do I have to resort to assembler now? I, I can't get GCC to do what I want writing it this way. Can I, do I have to resort to assembler? Well, the answer is no. You can use something called Neon Intrinsic. So the SIMD architecture for ARM, one of the names it goes by is Neon. Um, so that's why you've got, it's called Neon Intrinsic, so ARM Neon.h. 
basically, what I've done here is I've translated this code into the on intrinsic. So I'm explicitly doing this add. I'm saying I've got a 128-bit value that's split into 32-bit signed integers that I want to add and store in that vector. I've done some casting because that's nasty, but yeah, it's nasty casting, but hey, I've done it to keep the thing on the slide. Um, and we, instead of doing the loop one iteration at a time, one step at a time, we're going four steps at a time. So we've explicitly vectorized ourselves. And what code does this produce? Well, well, that looks quite good. Uh, it's a lot less code. It looks almost like what I would hope to see. So there. This is what we've got. We've got a function set up, vector loop, and it's a header and footer, which are just stuff that GCC outputs to let the compiler know what's going on, or let the assembler know what's going on. Um, so this looks good. We're loading the vector, add it, doing the vector add, storing the value, doing comparison, looping back. Um, but actually, if you go back to what my original code was, it was a bit less code than this. And there's this odd stuff of the thing. So is there anything we can do to get it to look like the original code? Well, actually, there is. I've changed here. Historically, our loop has been i going up. Um, I changed the, this so that it's n going down. I checked for n is not equal to 0, so I'm assuming n is a multiple of 4. Um, you can't just check here because n is greater than 0, because if n is not equal to 0, then it's greater than 0 because n is unsigned. So we're doing that, we're going down the loop. And hey presto, the code has got much, much smaller. In fact, the only instruction that I'm interested in, in this is this CBZ, which is compare and branch with 0. So it says compare a branch with 0, W3 with L1. And then if it's 0, branch to dot L1, which is a return instruction. Um, so what's CBZ? What, what's dot in W3? Well. Here we go, because the, the ABI says, so A will go in X0, or R0, X0. B will go in X1. C will go in X2. And N is a 32-bit value, so it will go in W3. So we're seeing if W3 is 0 right at the start, and if it is, we return. Now, I didn't have that in my original code, because I assumed that no one in their right mind would call my function with N being 0, but the compiler doesn't trust its users. Um, and so we'll put in safety code where it can. If it can't assume anything, it'll be put in code to make sure it can. So this is 0. It will return do nothing, which is what we intended. So that's the only additional function. And here, that's, so that's compiled with um, the 64-bit ARM compiler version of GCC. Here's what you get where you compile it with um, a GCC for the 32-bit ARM compiler. And aside from some differences, it looks very moderately like the code I initially wrote. Um, in fact, what it's done is it's added some alignment instructions. So it's saying, oh, well, you've promised m I, I can assume these um, vectors are aligned. I'll that might help speed things up. They're hints to the um, CPU that these vectors should be aligned. And so that's that. So that's almost like the code we started with. So the point here is, is that using the on intrinsics, you don't have to go to assembler. Right? I've written something in C that, yes, uses some special ARM functions, neon intrinsics. But actually, that produces good code for both 64-bit ARM and 32-bit ARM. We don't have to then go and waste a lot of time because the instruction mnemonics are different. So although it's basically the same code that comes out, you'd have to rewrite it to use different register names and instruction names. And actually, just using intrinsics saves you all that effort. And that's a worthwhile thing. So let's go back to this, the final thing we produced about auto vectorization. How bad is this code? Is this code actually that bad? Um, I'm going to contend that actually it's not. It'd be nice if we could get rid of the vector tidy up, and that would get rid of most of the function setup. But actually, that's only a constant overhead. In your function, the function setup, there's no loop up here in the red. 
is executed once, so it's a constant time, and then the vector loop just does the vector stuff. Um, and the vector tidy up, well, that's a constant overhead, and it's not even executed if you've got a multiple of four. So that's a good... It's, a good, it's got more code than we'd like to see, but actually it's probably not going to be that bad on performance. But if it is, and we've tested and we really want to change it, then I would contend that this code in Neon Intrinsics is actually fairly easy to read, and we would get good code out of it. Um, and as we've seen, we can get good code out of it. And therefore, it's a better level to be at than Assembler. And again, it makes the porting job easier, because with the original code we'd write, you'd have to write your loop as a fallback loop, the architectures that don't support, that you haven't done anything special for. You could then do one port for ARM for both 32-bit and 64-bit, and that would be um, all the porting done for ARM. And you might then, if for, let's say, x86, it doesn't vectorize properly, you might go and write some special code for x86, but you know, you've got a fallback loop and you've got one porting job for ARM, which produces the right code. Um, and my experience tells me that the modern compilers that are actually using Neon Intrinsics, taking its code that's been vector code that's been written in Assembler and porting it into Neon Intrinsics produces better code in general because the compiler does a better job of scheduling and so ordering the instructions and working out the dependencies so the compiler can be, do a better job that way. Um, so actually, this may even be better code than you could get by spending a lot of time yourself writing it by hand. So, as I said at the start, um, my aim today was to get you to trust the compiler. So do, we've got the Naro producer GCC-based toolchain. You can get GCC from the FSF. Um, you can get it from your standard Linux distro. Trust it, and if it doesn't do what you want, go and ask questions. So I would suggest you don't necessarily go straight to the FSF um, distro. You go straight, you go to the people you got it from, you ask them, because not all things that the compiler does are necessarily it doing the wrong thing. It's you not telling it everything it needs to know. And then you go and talk to people. So if you picked up the Naro toolchain, come and talk to us um, and work through. But use the toolchain. If, if you find issues with it, report them. We can't make toolchains better unless we actually know what the issues are with it. And that's what we want to do because writing assembler is far too much like hard work. Um, so that's it for me. Um, here's some links to about the NARO and what the NARO does. So thank you all very much. Um, I'll take questions if there are any. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, if you just want to pop your hands in the air, we'll come around. Any questions at all? Thank you, Matthew, for the talk. Oh, very interesting. Uh, quick um, question. How do you encourage developers to start uh, developing code for ARM, and why they need to choose ARM uh, if not other different architectures? And why do you encourage them to start doing in 64 bits? So why would I encourage them to do it for ARM? Well, most Android devices are ARM-powered, so that's a good start. You know, if you want to put it onto a mobile phone, you need to develop for ARM. Um, that's the main thing. Why 64-bit? Well, I'll be honest, I've seen 64-bit hardware. Um, I've seen demos of it, but it's rarer than hen's teeth to actually get any at the moment. So that's quite hard, but there are models out there, and people are announcing products that you've seen, or they will be announcing products, I imagine, soon um, for it. You've seen. I think some member, some ARM partners have announced products already for ARM V8 for 64-bit. Um, why develop for it? Because it's not new and exciting. 64-bit is where it's happening, right? ARM 64-bit is a new architecture. Um, I don't know how many partners ARM has announced publicly, but the, what the list I've s public list I've seen seems to be everyone is interested in ARM 64-bit in all the major semiconductor manufacturers. So this is where it's happening. This is going to be 20 years. Arms, ARM as an architecture is uh, 1990, I think, ARM as the company started. Um, so that's been 32-bit. It's the same length of time for 64-bit. It's 
this is a major change for the next 20 years, so getting on the ground. Any more questions? Go, Mad Dog. Hi, my name is John Mad Dog Hall, and I'm the executive director of Linux International. And I'm going to be giving a talk tomorrow at 4 p.m. about uh, performance and performance issues, and a lot of which was covered, same types of topics as were covered here. And to answer your question about why should you program in 64 bit, it's, you know, a lot of times we think about things that are, you know, reasonably sized for phones and for things, but when you're trying to design an airplane and you want to emulate the entire airplane, you need 64 bits. When you're trying to do weather forecasting, you need 64 bits. When you're trying to do uh, geophysical mapping and things like that, you need 64 bits. And so the types of things that he covered today is not only in the ARM architecture, but also in Intel 64-bit architecture and, yep. and other types of architectures. And understanding that allows you to make programs which are much more efficient. And people yep. say, well, CPUs are fast enough. But, you know, we're, we're talking about efficiency. And yep. if you can make your program finish that much faster, that means your, your operating system can go into a quiescent mode and your battery life becomes longer. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, if, and, or you or you save more memory space because you eliminate the holes. Yep. These are efficiencies yep. that are important. Yes. Uh, and of the stuff I talked about today, I think only the last topic, the vectorization, the neon intrinsics, not even most of the auto vectorization, only the neon intrinsic stuff is actually ARM specific. Everything else directly applies to other architectures moving from 32 bit to 64 bit. It's this, it's the issues you have to think about and what's going on. Um, it's a question, perhaps out, out of not knowledge, but there is um, there is a lot of work on, on going from 32 to 64 bit, and you, you mentioned a couple of things that developers need to worry about yep. or actually be cognizant of and, and do something about it when they're moving. And you said trust the compiler to produce the better code. Is anyone working on on a on a reverse type of compiler where you go and say actually here is here is the result of the code, and here's how you should start thinking, reshaping a program. It's like the feedback loop to the developer for the way actually programs are written. So it's a, it's a bit fudgy question. I understand yeah, that. no, I know. I'm, I don't actually know of anything that you can sort of go off the shelf and get a product that will solve that problem for you. Um, there are obviously, I think there are pro uh, projects. I think. The University of Ghent in Belgium are doing projects on things where they take code and they reanalyze it once it's been linked and it's all in what goes on. And there's things like there's profile guided optimizations that the compiler does that let's actually look at how this program's been used, what the flow through the program is, and then use that to make the compiler's decisions better next time. But you then have to go into profiling. So I think there's, a, there's products I know where you go and you you get hotspots so you can see where the time is spent in your code and that's where to go looking on a really deep level but actually you need to think about the algorithms right yes. looking at here this is all about algorithms if you've got an algorithm that's order n cubed no matter how much optimizing you do the majority of the time what actually doing an algorithm changing the algorithm to order n is going to be win right and then actually get to the point where actually the n cube, the constant for the n cube, the order n cube, is smaller for some types, so it's faster on small. And you pick the algorithm depending upon your input size. But, and that's useful stuff that you get through profiling. So then it provides O profile tools, and there are tools that use that. So I think profiling is probably the thing that helps you there, where you see the flow through your program. Any more questions then before we finish up? Thank you, Matthew, for your educational talk on 64-bit ARM. Thank you. Uh, round of applause for Matthew Gretton Dan. Thank you. And at 12 on the O2 main stage, there'll be Mitchell Baker. Thank you.